So good morning, everyone. It's a very rainy day in Sydney. I don't know where a bit where, what it's like where you guys are, but I hope I can share some information today on dementia, what we know about it, and hopefully some promising information that you might be able to take back into your day to day as well as for anyone who might have loved ones that are affected by mild cognitive impairment, which is the very early presentation of dementia and what, what we might be able to do about it at that early stage as well. And as Tracy mentioned, I'm one of the directors of Sydney Low Carb Specialists alongside my husband, Dr. Alex Petrushevsky, and we are a multidisciplinary clinic that uses GPs, dietitians, a health coach and an exercise physiologist to assist people to make low carbohydrate lifestyle changes. So today in terms of what we're going to speak about, I'm going to look at what are some of the types of dementia, but I want to focus primarily on the most common form of dementia in Australia, which is Alzheimer's dementia. I'm then going to talk about some of the medications we have routinely prescribed for quite a long time and question their effectiveness for this condition. Then we're going to talk about dementia as a metabolic problem, which many people haven't uh, heard, of, heard about. Um, and if you have heard about it, how we can then take that to the next level in terms of applying it into our daily lives. And then speak about a ketogenic strategy or a dietary framework that might may be able to help with intervening at any time in this disease, as well as additional strategies that we might be able to use for management as well. So the authority on dementia in Australia is Dementia Australia, and they define dementia as a collection of symptoms that are caused by disorders affecting the brain they say that it is not one specific disease, rather it's many different conditions that can cause dementia. And in most cases, why people develop dementia is unknown. We know that dementia can actually affect five different domains, which are memory, thinking, behaviour, communication, and an ability to perform activities of daily living. And in Australia, we have almost 1 million Australians above the age of 65 years of age affected by dementia in one way or another. And so this is quite a concerning issue and something that we do need to be paying more attention to as our population ages. As I mentioned before, Alzheimer's dementia is the most prominent of the dementias in Australia, affecting 60 to 80 percent of cases. But we also have significant problems with the second leading cause, uh, which is vascular dementia, which I'll briefly speak about later in the talk. There's also a raft of others that are linked to dementia and associated with the condition that are listed there as well. So what exactly is dementia at, uh, I suppose, a, a cell level? It's long been postulated that it's the formation of these things called tangles or plaques that can form and that these are not cleared effectively. In, in the areas that are um, in between neurons. And then this leads to miscommunication or communication disruption between our brain cells. And these um, plaques and tangles have long been one of the focus um, areas of research into dementia. But there are very likely multiple mechanisms far beyond what the research scientists have focused on for some time. So we will speak a little bit about the amyloid hypothesis, which I just referenced there, but there is now a concept that Alzheimer's dementia can be viewed as type 3 diabetes, or rather some form of glucose hypometabolism in the brain. And there is also the effect of family history, such as genetics. At the APOE4 genotype, is one of the ones that's implicated in an increased risk of Alzheimer's dementia. And also those people who are affected by Down syndrome have an increased risk as well. Gender is a very interesting one because women are two times more likely to actually develop and die of Alzheimer's dementia than men. And I'll speak a little bit more about that, as well as some of the other lifestyle issues of our modern society, such as sleep deprivation and chronic inflammation that can be as a result of uncontrolled 
autoimmune disease. So let's talk quickly about women and Alzheimer's dementia. One of the long standing reasons that we thought women were more affected than men is that they tend to live longer. And in fact, many, uh, many sources of um, research still point towards that as the reason. But in actual fact, women really only live on average about two years longer than men. So could it be something related to the abrupt cessation of uh, hormones in women that happens around menopause, so that huge decline in estrogen, versus the gradual loss of hormones that occurs in men. And if we compare this to, say, the paradigm related to breast cancer, we know that every woman who's diagnosed over 60 with breast cancer, for every one woman, there are two women who are actually diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And the cure rate for breast cancer is now approximately 90%, and yet the cure rate for Alzheimer's disease is zilch. And we have treatments for breast cancer that are actually effective, but no effective treatment yet for Alzheimer's. So one of the potential preventative medications that have been explored is estrogen itself, which is in the form of some form of menopause replacement therapy, which is the new term for hormone replacement therapy. And depending on which part of the literature you look at, it's estimated that it could in, reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's disease by anywhere between 20 to 50%. So that's staggering and potentially another way forward for women who are looking to either prevent or even uh, modify their disease progression. Additionally, sleep deprivation, which I'm sure Dr. Alex talked about yesterday, um, also relates to the incidence of dementia. And it appears that the mechanism behind this is that when we sleep well and we have good quality sleep, we can increase the clearance of those proteins I referred to earlier, these amyloid proteins, dysfunctional proteins that can build up inside the synapses, which is the area between neurons. And by doing so, that can reduce the long-term risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia. So one of the best preventative actions really is to make sure you capitalize on your sleep at nighttime. But how exactly is Alzheimer's diagnosed in Australia? And I think it's worth talking about that for a moment. Many people actually end up presenting with a symptom. So it might be, oh, doctor, or my, my memory is somewhat affected. I'm starting to forget things that have happened relatively recently and I'm having word finding difficulties. And other times it's relatives who might be bringing in um, a affected person worrying that they might be starting to develop some kind of cognitive impairment. And in any of these instances, it's important for us to actually take a history from not only the person who's affected, but the people around them, because together that collateral history can be quite important. Then usually GPs perform what we call a dementia screen, which is really looking for any other organic causes of possible dementia as many infections, nutrient deficiencies, uh, and other uh, inflammatory conditions can lead to a worsening in cognitive impairment. And if they're identified and fixed, can actually reverse the issue entirely. So the last tool that usually is applied at that initial phase is to ask people to undergo some kind of cognitive assessment. And in Australia, we tend to use the Montreal assessment or the Addenbrooks. And it's usually a 30 question questionnaire that is um, gone through with the person, it usually takes about 10 to 15 minutes and is targeted to try and look at the, the various domains of memory, thinking, reasoning, behavior, communication, and the ability to perform activities of daily living as well. And after that point, people are generally referred off to a memory assessment specialist or service. And it's at this point that most people are actually not investigated any further, but given a initial diagnosis of cognitive impairment uh, and or Alzheimer's dementia at that stage, if it's quite progressed. And some people where the diagnosis is unclear are often then evaluated with some sort of brain scan uh, and or a particular biomarker, which is becoming more available these days to access. So that's the standard of diagnosis. What's the standard of care then afterwards? Well, for decades, all we've really had is are these two groups of medications. 
The first one you can see here is the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And these medications really work by increasing the levels of a, um, of a chemical, which is called acetylcholine. And that's involved in memory and learning in the brain. So on paper, it sounds like this would be really quite helpful. And these medications tend to help improve cognitive symptoms and temporarily enhance memory and thinking abilities, but they come at quite a cost. There's quite, quite a lot of side effects that can actually worsen, in some cases, cognitive impairment rather than improve it. The second category there is memantine, which is a what they call an N-methyl D-aspartate receptor antagonist and this really works by regulating the activity of glutamate which is a neurotransmitter that is excessively released in Alzheimer's disease. So by blocking this glutamate signaling the memantine helps to protect brain cells from further damage and it also helps to improve cognitive and behavioral symptoms. But what we know of these conditions of these sorry treatments are that it doesn't stop cognitive decline, which is the one marker that we're really looking for. And really, in only 25% of people, there is a, even any perceivable response. And of that effect, the response is incredibly mild. So it doesn't really seem to be an effective, uh, an effective treatment that we've seen so far. This has paralleled for decades a focus on this obsession with lowering also the beta amyloid protein. And we've really started to question in the last five to 10 years if scientists have actually been wrong about Alzheimer's for decades, and we've gone down the wrong rabbit hole entirely. And often where there is one promising signal, lots of money is invested there, and that tends to become where the research scientists head because more funding can be gathered and attracted for the research that is required to be done. And hence the development of a new drug, which was recent, which was released in 2021. And these are what we call, or they're part of what we call the class of drugs that are disease modifying therapies. So actually starting to target and remove the amyloid plaque itself from the brain, as we've long thought that this was the reason that we get damage in the brain that leads to Alzheimer's disease. Now, this has heralded, heralded much praise and um, excitement from the various authorities in dementia. But have we really missed the mark with this one? Let's explore how the second iteration in this drug, aducunumab, was actually approved. In fact, in America, it has been approved by their regulatory drug authority, the FDA. And that was amid quite a lot of controversy in 2021 and 2022. What happened was that the FDA appointed an expert panel to advise them and to look into the data on this medication and put forth um, a vote basically as to whether or not this medication could be approved. And the expert panel, I think there were 10 or 11 participants in that panel, uh, of all of those participants, all but one voted against the approval of this medication as they did not believe it was going to change the trajectory of this illness in any positive way. And one person abstained. So that's a pretty clear signal that this is not a drug that was worthy of approval, yet the FDA did actually end up approving the medication and it is now in the formulary in dementia care in America and being regularly used. It costs 55,000 US dollars for one of these uh, drug treatments per year. And that um, is a significant cost. And there is great excitement that these medications are soon to be approved in the Australian Regulatory Authority, the TGA. So that's, that's coming soon to our, our mainstream and standard care. But again, it really focuses in on this amyloid hypothesis and what we know is that the drugs that have been shown to reduce the formation of amyloid and then maybe even bind and clear this amyloid really show no favorable impact on disease progression. So a little bit more about amyloid is that these plaques tend to build up and we've noticed their presence. And it's not that they don't exist, they're certainly there. But there's actually a counter hypothesis that these are protective and they're secreted from our brain cells, the neurons, as a normal process. This process is fine 
as long as these proteins are actually degraded and cleared effectively. So we're relying on other pathways to ensure that this works. So is the defect in this clearance process. The beta amyloid proteins, if they're not cleared effectively in Alzheimer's dementia, and they're left lying around in between all the neurons, are actually subject to a number of things. And one of them is this thing called glycation. And we know from the literature that advanced glycation end products are actually quite disruptive to the cells that lie in, in, and, in and around them, as well as the fact that they can impair the communication between the different brain cells by blocking the synapse, which is essentially like a bridge between brain cells, and that these plaques can actually cut off the communication between the neurons themselves. So you can see here in the schematic, you basically go from very minimal cognitive impairment all the way through to very severe outcome, which is when most people are diagnosed around the moderately severe stage with Alzheimer's dementia. So what is responsible for actually degrading that amyloid protein? Well, it's this thing called the insulin degrading enzyme. And that's an enzyme that is actually in the brain mostly there to degrade insulin. And insulin we know is a hormone that seeks to control our blood sugar levels very tightly within the bloodstream. The affinity of insulin degrading hormone for insulin is always higher than the affinity for beta amyloid. So wherever there is higher insulin levels circulating within the brain, the insulin degrading enzyme will be far too busy trying to account for the higher glucose levels and won't have a chance to really be effectively binding to degrading and clearing the beta amyloid. If we take this one step further in the APOE4 genotype, which I'll talk about shortly, but is one of the ones that's implicated in a much higher increased chance of developing Alzheimer's dementia, we know that the people who carry this genotype actually produce less insulin degrading enzyme. And this actually might even be an evolutionary holdover from a gene having been less favoured in an environment where there wasn't a need to degrade high amounts of insulin. So an example of this are in hunter-gatherer tribes where there was very little uh, stimulation of the need for insulin. So we really didn't need to make much of it, hence we didn't need much insulin degrading enzyme either, and therefore the development or selection for the APOE4 genotype occurred. So just to summarize, there are a number of proteins such as the beta amyloid protein and also this tau protein, which has become one of the measurable biomarkers in cerebrospinal fluid. So we now can do a CSF tau test, uh, which is usually at the, at the request of memory specialists. But that can, that can be done, and that helps to differentiate between the different forms of dementia, as you can see here. So we've talked quite a bit about the medications and also their ineffectiveness at, at really changing the trajectory of dementia. But there are also other uh, tools that are um, regularly spoken about in the current treatment guidelines, which are actually just reviewed this year as a consensus treatment uh, committee in Australia. And what they also talk, talk a lot about is the use of a Mediterranean diet or some sort of iteration, a variation on the theme of it. So these really sprout from various different dementia trials that have used food as a possible way to improve the outcomes for the disease. And what they ended up doing, rather than actually having an emphasis on real food, they developed it into something that could be marketed through pharma pharmaceutical means. And hence this product called Suvenaid is now already readily available on the Australian market and has been advertised quite heavily in the last few years to be started at the first sign of cognitive impairment. It's even marketed really as a medical food. Now, there are some other practical supports in place that they talk about in the current treatment guidelines, but these are really things that get put in place after the diagnosis and when things are quite moderate to severe. So it's really not about prevention at that stage. It's just about mere management and support and, and hopefully improving quality of life. So let's take on the issue with the nutrition side of things and why the guidelines might be missing the mark. 
Now, this emphasis on the Mediterranean diet is really because we have seen historically in the literature some signals or improvements that have been demonstrated with the DASH diet, which has been around for a long time to decrease blood pressure or the thought is that it can reduce hypertension. And then they thought the second thing they could add into the mix was to potentially just give people back nutrients in the form of synthetic supplementation using a medical food that has been copy or uh, trademarked as Fortisign Connect. And that's the main ingredient in Suvenade, this new drink that I'm just going to speak about shortly. So just to touch on the dietary side, we know from extensive literature culminating in this most recently published randomized control trial just this year, that even when you take a very low carbohydrate diet equivalent to the ketogenic diet and compare it head on with the DASH diet or some sort of Mediterranean diet variation, that the very low carb diet comes out superior in terms of reducing blood pressure, uh, reducing BMI and achieving weight loss, but as well as tightly controlling blood sugar levels comparative to the DASH diets or the Mediterranean equivalents. So I do question these guidelines as to whether their effectiveness is really uh, as good as they say they are. Then there is these medical foods, and I was really interested in learning more about what was in Suvenade. In fact, they even named the name Suvenade seems to come from a Latin derivative of the word souvenir, which is to restore or to have a memory of. So they really have taken on an amazing marketing team to get this to the wider public. Now, if you look at the ingredients, we soon find that the, the second and third ingredients are maltodextrin and sugar. And they actually even put on the label in a rather misleading way that people with diabetes could actually still consume Suvenade even though Suvenade does contain carbohydrates. And as with other foods that contain carbohydrates, it's actually advisable for people with diabetes to monitor their blood sugar levels and consult with their doctor. But of course, many doctors will not see 15.6 grams of carbohydrate per serving as a troubling effect for someone who's already got an intolerance to all carbohydrates, which is the case in type two diabetes. So a 15.6 gram serving is really the equivalent of almost four teaspoons of sugar. And we know that type two diabetics really can only handle one teaspoon of sugar at any one time in their bloodstream. So I feel like this drink, whilst it has a lot of great nutrients inside it, which is going to help, and we know that B, restoring B vitamins and omega-3 and choline are very important in the trajectory of brain health, it is actually also achieving an opposite effect in worsening sugar or glucose metabolism in the brain. So there are definitely other things that we could think of. And I, and I think this way, whole weekend, we've been talking about low carb and ketogenic diets as a, a fantastic tool that can be used for other conditions. I also think they're a fantastic tool within the prevention and treatment of dementia as well. So that, kind of flows on to this other way of thinking about dementia and that rather than it's just this sort of chronic progressive disease of which we don't know the reason or cause and we just allow it to run its course and do what very little we have in terms of medications to treat it, we could think of it as an energy deficit in the brain, which is really due to the loss of the capacity of our brain cells to harness energy from sugars. So there is a term that has been developed in the literature called cerebral glucose metabolism. And one group of researchers have actually reported a 45% reduction in this rate of glucose metabolism and have called this the predominant abnormality in Alzheimer's dementia. So rather than it being a consequence of the disease, it's proposed that it's actually causative of the disease. The reduced CMR glue, which is what it's abbreviated to, is actually present well in advance of the measurable cognitive declines that we see when we're actually trying to diagnose dementia. So you might recall we talked about these assessment tools that are about 30 questions um, in length, where we go through that with a person at the initial presentation. 
But we're suggesting that we can actually pick this up well in advance of this time. So well in advance that we've seen in the literature that it can happen as early as our 30s and 40s. And we can do this through a new technique, which is called fluorodeoxyglucose PET, or a PET scan that uses a glucose, glucose uptake tracer. So here you can see in these pictures, the lower the rate of glucose um, uptake, the more severe the condition of cognitive impairment. So on the left hand side, you can see a normal human brain and it lights up quite readily with all of the red. And that's actually demonstrating good glucose uptake within the brain cells. And as you get progression in cognitive impairment, you actually start to lose the uptake of that, particularly in an area of the parietal cortex, which is what those arrows are pointing to. And loss of uh, energy to those cells actually then end up causing those prominent symptoms we see in dementia. So the longitudinal studies that have been done using these amazing PET scans to measure the rate of glucose metabolism in people who are aged between 50 to 80 years of age, which is the typical age at which we start to see people presenting with cognitive decline, showed that also a reduced hippocampal metabolic rate of glucose, and the hippocampus is really responsible for memories, um, at baseline was strongly predicted to progress from a normal cognitive function to Alzheimer's dementia with the greatest reductions at baseline actually correlating with the quickest development as well. So we could actually even predict those people who will develop it, but also develop it in a very quick and quick way as well. So their, their time with the disease may be quite short. So one of the proposed mechanisms and maybe the leading hypothesis on why it's hard to get glucose into the cells of these, uh, of these people with the vulnerability to cognitive impairment is that the metabolic switch or the transporters that help to get glucose in there are actually in some way defective as well. So the problem is in the brain is that there are multiple glucose transporters and these lie within cells to help glucose get from outside of the cell to inside the cell. And the glucose transporters that are responsible at the blood brain barrier and at brain cells themselves are actually not insulin sensitive, which is uh, basically to say that you don't need insulin there to help the glucose cross the blood brain barrier and then get into the cells. But the, there is a glucose transporter, the GLUT4, which is insulin responsive, and that tends to be at the hip, in the hippocampal tissue. And as I mentioned, that is really heavily involved in memory and learning. It's responsible for those two aspects. And again, that's one of the things seen earliest in the symptoms that people report with Alzheimer's dementia. So the insulin resistance that can worsen with this reporter and if uh, this transporter, and if this transporter is also quite defective, it means that we really just can't get energy across readily into these areas of the brain. So that's the concept of type 3 diabetes, where you have a reduced brain glucose metabolism that is actually measurable in people at risk as young as their 30s, long before any signs or symptoms even appear. And the hallmark of this is actually brain insulin resistance, or in other words, high insulin, hyperinsulinemia. Now, type 2 diabetes has been well known to be a risk factor for Alzheimer's dementia, but not every single person with diabetes tends to develop Alzheimer's dementia. So we have also seen that there have been high insulin levels independently, and that can double the risk of developing your Alzheimer's dementia, even when the people who were studied were not diabetic. So that just means that we need to start looking more critically at the pre-diabetic population and starting to identify insulin as it rises rather than just tracking our blood sugars as the way to know if we're at increased risk. So this brings it all together and it's a schematic that's been created by Dr. Stephen Cunane, who is a famous research scientist in the area of Alzheimer's dementia. And he's basically putting this into three phases of development of the condition starting with phase one, which is that the 
reduction in getting sugar into the adequate cells in the particular areas of the brain that are responsible for many of these domains that get affected with dementia is where the initial trigger point is. And that in phase two, we then start to see the buildup of amyloid proteins and tau proteins and other things we see that can happen, which are called neuropathology of the disease. And then in phase three, that's where we really get people presenting with their clinical symptoms of the condition. And his proposal in his lab research is that if we can break the cycle at any one stage here with the use of a ketone strategy, then maybe we're onto another way of being able to affect the trajectory of this condition. So potentially one of the, one of the groups of people that would benefit the most from this are those people who are the carriers of the APOE4 gene. And we know that this is actually the strongest known genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's dementia, where having one copy from one of your parents can confer an increased risk, but having two copies, one from each parent, confers an even greater risk to the point that 50% of the population who have the APOE4 gene develop Alzheimer's dementia by the age of 90 years of age. So it is quite a strongly predictive um, gene. However, you know, if you a glass half full type person, uh, then you would also say that you also have 50% chance of not developing the condition as well. So we still have to be careful with our interpretation of the numbers. But what we know is that really the APOE4 gene actually represents the link between dementia and our modern diet because our genes haven't really changed but it's actually the expression of those genes and how it's modified by environment that has. So as I mentioned, the highest frequency of the APOE4 gene is found in the long time hunter gatherer populations around the world. And that may actually just be an evolutionary mechanism because they really did not have high insulin levels that required uh, degradation and that required the insulin degrading enzyme. So the E4 carriers are really the ones who are most suited to using a ketogenic diet, particularly in this day and age where the modern standard food environment is incredibly high carb. On average, Australians are consuming somewhere between 300 to 400 grams of carbohydrate per day. So the potential drivers of Alzheimer's dementia to summarize are impaired ability to um, metabolize sugar in the brain particularly in those brain cells and get them into the brain cells and having high insulin levels, even in the absence of an elevated blood glucose. So we need to really focus on those pre-diabetics. And then those people who then have the genetics, so potentially Down syndrome or the APOE4 gene, as well as a family history without any of that genotyping should be those who are really considering a ketogenic strategy. So the ketogenic diet, basically provides ketones to the brain and the brain actually prefers ketones where it can get access to it. And the reason for this is that in um, the traditional view of how much blood sugar is required by the brain, we usually know that it's about 100 to 125 grams of blood sugar per day that's needed by the brain. But in mild cognitive impairment, that drops by 10%. And then in Alzheimer's dementia, that drops by another 20 to 40%. So we know a brain cannot function on only 60 to 70% of blood sugar. Mind you, on a ketogenic diet, that blood sugar is actually not coming from what we, of what sugars we eat in the diet. It's coming from sugar that we can actually synthesize in the liver th through a process of gluconeogenesis. So we can still have a primarily protein and fat heavy diet and still be able to produce the amount of blood sugar our brains need per day. Now, Stephen Kinane, Dr. Stephen Kinane made two points in his research. And the first is that Alzheimer's dementia is at least in part exacerbated by chronic progressive brain fuel starvation. So this is talking about running a brain on only 60 to 70% sugar per day. And then number two is attempting to treat this cognitive deficit very early in Alzheimer's dementia using ketogenic interventions that have actually proven to be safe, ethical and scientifically well founded. So we now have really good evidence to be able to recommend this at a wider population level. The 
preparations that have been widely studied that could be quite helpful come in the form of what we call exogenous ketones or medium chain triglyceride, MCT preparations. One of which is a naturally occurring one called coconut oil, and that is readily converted to ketones in the liver and that mildly elevates blood ketones as well as a result. It's made up of three different forms of MCT, C8, C10 and C12. But C8 is actually the most ketogenic of all of the forms of MCT as it has the shortest chain to be able to be absorbed. And that's the one, C8 and C10 are the ones that have been focused um, most heavily with the research. So just to recap, ketones um, are actually the brain's main alternative fuel to glucose where, wherever we have a glucose deficit. And they, um, are, they are known as a fuel, but they also do a number of other things. So they can help with signaling and also even epigenetic um, uh, impacts as well within the brain. But the focus of Dr. Stephen Kinane's research has been on using the ketones as a fuel even if they're not necessarily coming from the diet, they could be added on as an adjunct in the form of salts and esters, or even from dietary preparations that could mimic drinks such as Souvenade, but actually be a ketone version of that drink. Hence the birth of this particular trial called the Benefic study. And this was actually using um, or measuring the cerebral glucose metabolism, so brain energy, and looking at functional imaging studies, so using those FDG PET scans and monitoring the participants over time, and then also tracking their cognition using some of those cognitive assessment tools. And what this study did, which where in a, in a field where there was actually no published work up to this point in time, and this is very recently, you can see the date here is 2019, that describes the measurement of the relationship between brain ketone uptake and the brain outcomes after a ketogenic MCT drink is given as the intervention in participants who had already been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And what it demonstrated for the first time is that it, you can actually increase certain cognitive outcomes in direct relation to that change in the brain energy sources. So what this looks like on that FDG PET scan is that you can see here on the left-hand side where we've got the CMR glue column. Pre the drink, there is some uptake of the glucose there and it doesn't seem to change with this ketone drink. And that's what we would expect because still these cells are uptaking glucose to an extent, 60 to 70% anyway. And then in the second column where we're looking at what happens with ketone uptake, so they were able to develop a ketone tracer and track it through the cells and scan for that, the brain lights up and particularly it lights up when you're using the C8 version, the very, very short chain, that short chain um, acid or medium chain triglyceride, the shortest of the medium chains. And you can see the brain actually laps that up preferentially and this led to seeing improvement across three domains that they found of that are significant in dementia, which were executive function, memory, and language. So all of these improvements appeared to be a direct relation to having higher plasma ketone levels and higher brain ketone uptake, as was proven with the PET scans that were done using ketone traces. So the conclusion that this group have found is that rescuing brain energy with a ketogenic MCT drink can actually significantly improve the cognitive outcomes in mild cognitive impairment. Absolutely fascinating information that I've just been blown away by to, to find out about. And this is a very beautiful summary, an elegant summary by that research group that is that really looks at all of these multiple pathways and these established risk factors that we know of and how that marries up with the use of ketones. So you can see that with insulin resistance, which is right at the top, if we know someone is insulin resistant, meaning they're in that pre-diabetic phase, having high blood insulin levels, but normal blood sugars, and, and we can 
and that they are having this already in their 20s. This is a hallmark that can already lead to the decline in a brain energy um, fuel, which is the sugar, well before cognitive decline even becomes apparent. We know that if you're an APOE4 carrier, you've got the family history of Alzheimer's dementia, and even just aging, so being above 60 years of age, as well as having some other mutations like the pre ln one mutation, and you're only in your 30s, these are some of the risk factors that should be motivating people with these conditions to start to prevent the progression of, of such disease where it's almost like this silent killer. You don't really know until it's right there with very extreme symptoms. So it's really at that time that where the research needs to go is to start to look at using not only ketone MCT drinks, but potentially using the ketone MCT drinks alongside a very low carbohydrate dietary approach that is a lifestyle for these patients. So with the ketogenic diets, we know that dietary ketosis now can enhance memory in mild cognitive impairment. And that's what the research there has shown. And we need to actually maintain that ketosis to sustain cognitive benefits. So it's simply not a crash diet. It's not something that we can go into and off of. And I think that's really important for people to know that it's about adopting this as a long-term lifestyle strategy. It's okay to have excursions from that strategy, maybe five to 10% of the time, but really the presence of ketones is how we can really capture that shortfall in the glucose, because we know that in those people with mild cognitive impairment, they're only really using 60 to 70% blood sugar in their brains and not being able to have any other form of energy to plug the shortfall. And these MCTs, which are combined with a ketogenic diet as a potential strategy, or even lowering carbohydrate intake, so maybe not even getting to the ketogenic spectrum, but maybe a moderate to liberal low carb approach, may actually even achieve a greater positive impact. So I'm hopeful that Dr. Kinane's group and other groups are going to start to look at the combination of the dietary impact as well as the use of exogenous ketones. In fact, I believe that in the pipeline at the moment is a study from his group and others into nursing home patients where the use of a, of a ketogenic drink as well as just changing some of the meals of the day, so not all but some, um, may actually provide um, benefit to these people who already have mild cognitive impairment. And that's a very hopeful premise for people who have family or friends that are in such facilities at the moment and are witnessing them having a lower quality of life as a result of their dementia symptoms. So just a quick word now on vascular dementia. You might remember I said it's the second most common type of dementia in Australia, and that's probably no surprise to anyone because we know that cardiovascular disease is a huge um, has had a huge impact on the Australian population. Increased risk, risk of heart attacks and strokes are routinely seen year upon year. And we're getting better at treating them once it's occurred, but what we're not getting better at is preventing them. And we also have this sort of old adage that what is good for the heart is actually good for the brain. And I believe that is true as long as the information that you know or the details that we use for what is good for the heart are the accurate details. So in vascular dementia, it's really just uh, lots of stepwise cognitive decline every time somebody has what we, what looks like a micro stroke or a micro <clears throat> infarct, they call them. And that's just where you're getting small clots that are blocking off certain um, or partially blocking off the oxygen supply and also the fuel supply to certain parts of the brain. And the, the heart healthy diet that is promoted at the moment is unfortunately still within the realms of the Australian dietary guidelines, which have a lot of um, have a lot of problems with them, as which I'm sure many of you listening to this talk today are aware of. So I won't go into those, but suffice to say, I do believe a diet that is very low in blood sugar and hence is trying to ensure a reduction in insulin resistance and blood sugars, which are 
toxic to blood vessels, as well as a diet that provides good saturated fat that is less likely to become oxidized within our arteries is going to be the combination of factors that lead to what is actually a better diet for the heart and therefore for the brain. So that would be my sort of working hypothesis and what we are, what we do regularly with patients, which is to really improve their heart health through a dietary spectrum. So really I think Alzheimer's dementia is actually more a disease of our civilization because our genes are not really changing. Our genotypes have been around for centuries, uh, thousands of years, and they persist to this day, but we are not fit for the modern environment where we have an excessive intake of refined carbohydrates. We have easily oxidized polyunsaturated fatty acids that are coming from our vegetables and seed oils. And we're experiencing inadequate sleep because somehow it's a badge of honor to sleep less these days and work harder and experiencing far more psychological stress than any of our ancestors were um, exposed to. We've got a disruption in our circadian rhythms as a result and also, also experiencing an insufficient level of physical activity. So these are all the problems of modern civilization and our genes are just not suitable for that. So we need to start to modify the expression of those genes by heading back to as much as possible forms of living that mimic our ancestral uh, way of living. So just a word on physical activity. And this is a study that was done, um, a longitudinal population study actually in women that was published in Neurology in 2018. And what that was looking at was how active a woman was in her midlife around the time of perimenopause. It was actually associated with almost a complete absence of late life dementia. And that is incredible. So even just the power of an adjunctive practice like regular physical ex exercise is going to equate to a 90% reduction in dementia in people with this high level of fitness in midlife. So even just moving um, is a powerful intervention for dementia. So that's a, another motivating factor to get out there and, and move your body in whatever way you feel uh, you can comfortably do. So just in summary, Alzheimer's dementia is very likely a disease of civilization rather than just something we can resign ourselves to developing as a result of old age. And it's a product of our dietary and lifestyle choices being incongruent with how humans have evolved or to what we have been adapted to in the past. I think the key point also to remember is that there is very likely a point in Alzheimer's dementia where the brain cell loss or damage is really too severe to reverse. So what this means is we should focus heavily on prevention or action even at the moment someone is diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment rather than just waiting and seeing and taking a very laid back approach to the issue. So thank you very much. And it's been wonderful to present this information to all of you today. Oh, wow. Deepa, that was incredible. So obviously that's Deepa and Alex at Sydney Low Car. Make sure you connect and follow. They are two incredibly um, smart, obviously, but just really um, deeply passionate about getting answers. So, you know, you won't be disappointed if you follow them. I'm just going to remove that out, Deepa, so we can, sure, we no can chat. Oh, my gosh, what an incredible presentation. So many barriers to all of this, you know, when we look at the that stupid drink. Oh, my God, honestly, they can't do it unless they can make money and then they have to put together some concoction that is just ah, total crap. It is. Um, how frustrating. And that's um, a very new drink. It's only been released in the last one to two years and it's at the same time as parallel research is going on across the globe on ketone drinks and their formulations and how beneficial they are. So you can see the disparity. You got two things, one end of the spectrum and then one on the other side. And no wonder patients are confused. No wonder yeah. the whole community is confused as to what to do. And of course, these nutraceutical companies and pharmaceutical companies have heavy, heavy investments uh, from funding 
coming from all sorts of directions. And I think their marketing teams are incredibly good at selling this stuff. Mm. Oh, and I forgot to say that drink um, shows the greatest benefit if you take it daily for three years. So it's a commitment at the onset to be taking this drink for three years alongside whatever diet you're on. It's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy, crazy. So a couple of questions. Um, I, is, and I, I think actually one of the presenters might have mentioned this at some point during the talk or it's just something that I've heard out there, but is it safe to actually be in ketosis for the longer term? Because obviously what you've shown here is the benefit of ketones and it's well known with, for the brain, but there's some people, you know, <coughs> excuse me, that say that maybe we shouldn't be in ketosis all the time to you, what's your view on whether there's any contraindications on that being true? I think there is a there is good historical evidence that most people consuming a low carbohydrate diet, but from a real food approach, and doing so in the form of being able to still feast and fast. So this is sort of a concept of ancestral living where you've come upon certain foods in your environment such as fruits which are higher in fructose and would tip you out of ketosis uh, just for momentarily you know maybe for a few hours could be a day that that was probably how our cells have adapted so we've always been able to use glucose and ketones and it's just that because of the modern construct we started to think that we need blood sugar all the time for everything, but that blood sugar had to come from the diet, that we got caught up in the whole you shouldn't be in ketosis all the time. Mm. And it's actually not that, not that glucose is preferred, it's just that we prefer to get rid of it or to make sure it's normal in mm. terms of its oxidative priority. So wherever the sugar does rise, yes, of course, we're going to just start using that, because we, that's actually the more toxic form of the energy. But whenever it drops, we actually want to be using ketones. That is our, our preferred source of energy. Mm. So my thought is unless you're someone who's trying to trigger, you know, there's, there's certain reasons why some people might need some glucose in the mix, for instance, elite athletes who are, you know, after some particular pursuit, they might benefit from having a boost of glucose at one stage or another through their training um, and through their actual performance in an event. But for the average human being, I think there isn't really any requirement to be, you know, strictly, um, you know, one way or the other, very black and white about it. I think there is still the room for that five to 10% of the feast where you mm. do have some rise in glucose and drop. And that's probably mirroring more so what ancestrally we would have come across. So not always being in one fluid state of ketosis all the time. Yeah, interesting. I, I think um, I remember now it was um, Dr. Angela Stanton was talking yesterday about migraines and she mm. was saying how actually ketones for a migraine sufferer in the beginning can be actually um, triggering um, and mm. not, um, so what, you know, uh, I can't remember the exact context of it. I'll have to go back and have a look at it. But um, I I is there any um, research or evidence that you know around people who suffer from migraines being more likely to have something like dementia? I'm not sure about that. I'd have to no. have a look. Yeah. It yeah, makes we'll sense to... mechanistically that in obviously migraine sufferers will also have various problems within their brain that will overlap those people who are at the early um, early side of mild cognitive impairment. So there's quite a mm. lot of overlap across all neurological conditions. Mm. So I'm not surprised that at one stage in the treatment for these conditions, initially there is no effective use of ketones because it's just not being part of the mix and it's actually part, it goes back to that basic principle of there is a three to four month adaptive phase where you increase your ability to use ketones over that period of time, particularly if you're very new to a ketogenic strategy. So that first initial three to four months, I that 
we do see clinically in practice and we warn people about this is that if they do suffer from migraines you might actually stimulate a migraine initially because yeah. your body is just not unable to utilize certain uh, utilize effectively and at a high enough rate ketones as a brain energy mm. source so mm. that's not uncommon to see so i guess you know clinically and mechanistically i could see there is a link i just don't know of any specific research that's looked at that no interesting interesting um so we've only got a couple more minutes before mm. um i need to let you go and we've got our next speaker waiting but um, I've been I've written down this for about four speakers and I've just not gotten around to asking the question. There is a few, there's lots of comments in the comments. Um, but uh just saying how interesting everyone's just been glued to what you've been saying. Cause I think it's, you know, hey, if we don't have a healthy brain, nothing else matters, right? So this is just so, so important. But poofers, you talked about it, it's been mentioned a number of times. I have seen now so many times re recently on social media, of course that this poofers being a problem has been debunked. Do you have a couple of minutes to say whether that is just crap or not? Mm, so polyunsaturated fatty acids. So I think it just boils down to the fact that if you look at their chemical structure, they've got unstable bonds. They're called the double bonds. And a monounsaturated fat such as olive oil has one double bond so that that mono refers to one the poly refers to many so in seed oils there's many unstable bonds and then in a saturated fat there's no unstable bonds there's no double bonds whatsoever so the saturated fats we know are the fats that are room, um, at room temperature they're solid so it's things like butter and coconut oil lard tallow suet uh not unsurprisingly these are fats that have been in our diets for centuries and then we've got the monounsaturated fats which are a relatively new phenomenon because our ability to process things like olive oil in the large quantities we do today had to have the help of uh, machinery and you know extra chemical processing to ensure that they're not getting oxidized the longer they sit from the time of extraction to then the time of consumption. So they're very vulnerable, even with their one double bond. So maybe they are a halfway house between all the oils. So olive oil is probably not as dangerous as the vegetable oils and seed oils, which have many, many unstable bonds that get worse with how long they sit on the shelf and worse with how long they've traveled as well to, to be in the supermarket where you purchase it from. And then, of course, when you buy it and keep it in your home, you've obviously opened the bottle and it's getting exposure to oxygen and the oxidation just worsens. So it's, it's just as soon as it's produced, it just starts to accumulate. So yeah. it's I don't agree with the people who are saying that this has no consequence. I, I truly mm. believe there is a consequence to allowing these oils to remain in the food supply. And even where we see people who've already removed refined sugar from the diet, they don't tend to improve the inflammation within their body, which happens from a raft of, um, you know, could happen from medical conditions, but can also just be inherently present, such as joint aches and pains, um, you know, reports of people who have, have removed sugar and feel somewhat okay but the next step is they remove the seed oils and they suddenly feel the resolution in those yeah. in those inflammatory symptoms so <laughs> we can't really separate that that what like what we see clinically and say that that is somehow a false premise because it's happening and people are experiencing that improvement so i think it is critical to remove one of the chemicals that can enter our body that can continuously undergo further oxidation even within the bloodstream um, and cause some of that inflammatory response. So I think it is still a very much a critical part of the like, Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's interesting what you say about the olive oil because I think that's maybe maybe what they've done is just taken, you know, a cherry picked and to suit their, you know. Anyway, it was just something I wanted to throw up there, but we've reached our limit as much as we could talk for a lot for ages and I hope that... Uh, We'll get to do it again, Dr. Deeper. That was just fabulous. Thank you so, so much for your time, your commitment to putting that together and sharing that with us. There's many comments saying how amazing it was and it's super informative. Thank you very, very much. Um, so I'm going to let you go, but enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thanks, Tracy. Thank you for having me involved in the weekend. I'll see you soon. Bye.